She earned her doctorate. Thank you, Jared. She earned her doctorate in school psychology from Syracuse University. Dr. Cotting completed her internship and fellowship at the May Institute in Massachusetts, where she served as an educational and behavioral consultant. Dr. Cotting's research focuses on developing and exploring the effectiveness of school-based interventions, the factors that contribute to student responsiveness of those interventions, and strategies to support implementation. Dr. Cotting's work has emphasized academic interventions and assessment for database decision-making, particularly in math. She was the co-recipient of the Leitner Whitmer Award for this research in 2010. Dr. Cotting is editor of the APA Division 16 journal, School Psychology. Dr. Cotting has over 85 publications and 120 peer-reviewed and invited presentations. She is the co-author of a book available from Guilford Press titled Effective Math Interventions, A Guide to Improving Whole Number Knowledge. So without further ado, I am pleased to turn it over to Dr. Robin Cotting. Thank you. I'm so excited. Whoop, I think that took a second. Uh, thank you. I'm so excited to um, be here with all of you. I'm delighted that you're interested in taking this journey, and I'm excited to help you navigate this, uh, this opportunity to engage in class-wide math intervention. And as the title says here, we're really going to focus on addressing skill gaps through daily warm-up activities. So in terms of our overview for what I'm hoping we can accomplish today, I want to begin with why class-wide interventions. So, so um, this portion of our session today will be mostly me saying things, um, but I'm, it's only a, a third of the session. And then the rest of the time, we're going to really talk about how you're going to engage in these class-wide intervention approaches. So first is why class-wide interventions? Second is what are class-wide interventions in general? We're gonna be focusing specifically on peer-mediated interventions and I'll provide the rationale for why we're gonna do that. Um, and then I'm gonna give you a 15 minute break um, if that's okay with the organizers because I feel like that would be a good spot um, for us to pause think about what um, we just talked about, and then we're going to get into the really the action part of the time that we have together, which will be building your own class-wide intervention, looking at the materials that you have available to you, um, and then finally we'll close with using data to inform those class-wide interventions. So the opening is why class-wide interventions? <clears throat> So I'm sure all of you are um, thinking about and experiencing the gaps that we're seeing in student learning. Um, the, this is some of the recent uh, popular press articles that have come from uh, this. I think this one's particularly from the uh, National Public Radio article. And then you can see the National Assessment of Educational Progress data. And we knew that this was coming. Um, you could tell just in looking at some of the longitudinal data that some of the big data companies have that do universal math screening. So we knew that there were these declines that were happening post uh, COVID, once students were returning to school and there's a host of factors that have influenced why or how much drops we are seeing. One of the remarkable things though that I think um, I can't highlight enough is that the gap here was largest in math. And this is not unusual. We have seen these large drops in math um, when we see uh, large national disasters like Hurricane Katrina. The gap was larger in math than it was in reading. So really, um, we shouldn't be surprised to see this very large gap in math. But it does suggest that we need to be doing more to support students and to ensure that we don't continue to have these drops and we can buffer some of these drops. So what you're looking at is um, the article from NPR, as well as a, the National Center for Educational Statistics, illustrating to you that you know most recently we had the first ever score drop in mathematics when you look at that NAEP data. Um, and I believe this was for the age nine grades. So I, I point all these things out in part because it provides the rationale for why we're using class-wide intervention and in part to recognize the challenges that all of you are facing as you're entering this year and as you're looking at the, where you think the students are and where you have hoped that they are. So another um, piece of data, and this is the data I was referring to earlier, is the data that we were able to gather from some of those large data companies that do that universal screening 
with large data. So they have these large national data sets. And um, I think what's remarkable when you look at the 2020-2021 school year is that although K-8 students started the year behind, what's uh, really interesting is that they made fewer gains. So it wasn't just that they were coming in having lost content, it's that that starting point actually resulted in fewer gains over the course of the school year than prior to the COVID pandemic. We saw a median achievement drop um, from eight to 12 percentile points compared to the spring of 2019. And the average loss, which you've probably at this point heard the statistic quite a few times, the average loss over the 2020-2021 school year was five months of learning. So as we think about this, there's been a lot of proposals that have been written about in terms of what can we do to address these needs. And uh, um, at the end of the day, many of us believe, I mean, it, one of the biggest things is um, intensive tutoring people have suggested, which of course doesn't really map on if you're in schools and you understand the resources that schools have, intensive tutoring isn't really a reasonable uh, solution to what we need to do. So many of us believe that the reasonable solution is exactly why you're here today. It's in addressing it through these class-wide approaches. Um, and it brings us back to really focusing on what is this layered MTSS model. And I know all of you are working within these models and these teams or working to have a math version of this if you have a reading version of this. But we know that to support the uh, needs of all learners in our buildings, it's important to remember that MTSS is layered. It's a layered series of supports. It's predicated on high quality tier one supports. And I have two different graphics here, mainly because I couldn't decide which one uh, was more powerful in illustrating this layered effect. Um, it's really important. Um, the whole premise of MTSS is, is um, hinge on the differentiation among these tiers. And as you can even see from these graphics, it all starts with what happens in core instruction. We have some really great data as background um, to help us realize uh, the, re the importance of this class-wide intervention. And so what you can see in this graphic, as you see at the very base of the triangle, is high quality instruction um, with provided in general education classes using evidence-based practices. It is the base of the triangle. And from there, of course, we're gonna provide our targeted and individualized supports, but those students won't do as well either, even with those additional supports, unless we have that base. And that base is what happens in that core instructional practice. We know that when you strengthen core instructional practices that you reduce the number of students who will require additional supports to be successful. We know that when you strengthen core instructional practice, you will free up resources to provide those students with or at risk for learning disabilities, the services and the supports that they need. We know that if you strengthen core instructional practices that you're going to see increases in the accuracy with which you're able to identify the students that need specialized intervention supports. So there is some really good data from Amanda Vander Hayden and colleagues who have illustrated that if you just do a short term four to six week class wide intervention, you can better identify the students that need support because you're bolstering the skills of all students and the students that don't respond to that class wide intervention. Um, those are the students that you want to target for your, your more specialized intervention approaches. And when we strengthen core instructional practices, it results in better outcomes for students receiving specialized intervention supports. So this is really interesting data. Um, this is data that's been around actually for quite a long time that illustrates that when you have um, a solid tier two intervention, let's say, if you don't also have a corresponding, and it doesn't have to match the intervention, I just mean that there's also a good solid um, intervention or, or curriculum provided in core instruction, that's done with integrity, um, you do better. So students when in tier two that had not a solid tier one actually didn't do as well as students that had the combination of tier one and tier two, even though the tier two intervention was the same. So this is, I think, very powerful data to illustrate the necessity of that core instructional practice and what happens in the general education classroom. 
So of course, when you're looking at your screening data and you're thinking about your classrooms, what you hope to see is something like the standard MTSS pyramid that probably many of you have seen a number of times. And in this pyramid, the idea is, um, hypothetically, that the core instruction with that 80 to 90 percent of the student population is going to be responsive. They're going to uh, receive the core instruction. They're going to be learning at the rate that we anticipate. Um, and then from there, you have approximately 20 percent of your student population that is going to need some additional supports. They may be moderate targeted interventions or they more be, may be individualized intensive interventions. There's also, however, um, the reality of what's happening in the classroom. And we already talked about this new reality that we have post the COVID era. So this is a, a, a graphic for you. It comes from uh, the IRIS Center, which is a center that I really like. If you're interested in looking at more math modules or more information on math, they have a lot of content there. But I like this graph and I hope it, yep, yeah, it doesn't have the um, video, I mean the audio here, which is good. So what this graphic is illustrating is that in a standard class of 25 students, there are going to be six students that struggle with math. There are going to be five of those students that are going to benefit from tier two supports, and then two students that are going to need that intensive individualized supports. So as we start to unpack this theoretical model of 80% of students are going to respond to our core instruction, we can see that it doesn't always line up the way that the theory suggests. Another thing to keep in mind is that we know that 17% of school-aged children will experience difficulties in math. Five to 10% of those students will experience what we call persistent low achievement. And as many as 7% of school-aged children experience specific math disabilities. So in other words, there's going to be a considerable number of students in your classrooms that are struggling in math, even if they don't end up having a math disability. So what is illustrated here are alternatives of the actual pyramid that you may be seeing. So <clears throat> as opposed to that theoretical pyramid, you may have a number of different uh, configurations of what your actual universal screening data is looking like or what your experiences are as you're walking into your classroom. You can see three different triangles here or pyramids. Um, the one on the far left side of your screen is that there's approximately 50% of the students that are responding to your core instruction and 50% that need support. And then in the other two graphics, we're seeing it's more what we call an upside down or flipped pyramid, where you have more like 80% of students who need support, whether that be strategic, moderate levels of support or, in, or intensive levels of support. And the only difference in these two pyramids is which percentage of students needs that intensive support and which needs that more moderate support. So thinking about all of these uh, background uh, information that we have, what we know about students who are already going to walk into the classroom that struggle based on our long history of data talking about math struggles, as well as thinking about the exacerbation of students' difficulties in math from the COVID-19 pandemic. The suggestion from some experts, especially MTSS experts in the field in the area of math, is that we actually have another tier in our pyramid. We have core instruction, and then we have what um, Kovaleski and colleagues will call the 1.5 tier, which is class-wide supplements. And the goal with these class-wide supplements is actually to address foundational skill gaps for the whole class. So you're thinking about the class as a whole, and on average, who, what are the skills that students are still not getting that we're going to need to bolster in order for them to actually access that core grade level instruction? And then subsequent to that, you have your secondary and tertiary interventions. And so if you think about um, the data that I was just describing earlier from Amanda Vander Hayden and colleagues where they showed that just even a short class-wide intervention approach can better identify those students who truly need uh, tier two and tier three support and can provide the rest of the class with the supports that they need in order to access that good grade level core instruction. So hopefully at this point, you have said, okay, Robin, I understand why we have this class-wide intervention tier, if you want to call it that, or that approach. Um, the next thing to talk about is what do we do during that time? And is there um, some evidence that we have that can help us with that? <clears throat> 
So what I have here, and um, I use this graph quite a lot because I think this data is fascinating. This data comes from um, the John Hopkins Center for Database Decision Making and Education. Um, you can see that I have the citations down here. There's a recent one from 2021 and one from 2009. What you're seeing in the dark bars is the primary data, the data for elementary school, and in the striped bars is the secondary data. Um, the more recent data is from the primary or elementary school data. And um, what you have on the y-axis is effect sizes. So you see I have this arrow for small for 0.2, medium for 0.5, and large for 0.8. Um, and so we can see here that your curricula, um, and these are meta-analyses, so this was the synthesis of all the evidence-based practices and studies that exist. The curricula doesn't really have an impact on student achievement. So you can see that it's less than a small effect. Um, we see a tiny bit uh, better for elementary school than for, for secondary level. Computer-assisted instruction, and this is, is um, sort of the old school computer-assisted instruction, um, not necessarily the tablet-based activities. Um, you can see that the effect of computer-assisted instruction on overall achievement is, is very low. Again, um, you, we sometimes call those effect sizes negligible because um, they have a you know, 0 0.08 in front of them. And then you can see the biggest bang that you get um, for your practices is with this category called instructional process. An instructional process category, I will unpack for you in a moment, but this is, um, and, and you're probably looking at me like, wait a minute, Robin, we're still only at a small effect size. In, in education, getting a small effect size, is, it can be good, especially when we're thinking about it uh, in the context of many other things. Um, obviously, we prefer to have effect sizes that are over that hinge point um, that Hattie has taught us all about, of 0.4. But when we look at the data that exists in math, the best outcomes that we that we were able to see from these meta analyses is from this instructional process. So what we actually do in the classroom. So this is another table that's explaining the same thing. So curricula, we get a minimal benefit. Digital curricula or computer assisted supplemental instruction is negligible to minimal effect. But the instructional process has a, a small positive effect and we want to be able to use that. So what constituted that instructional process? It was peer-mediated learning, classroom management, motivation, and metacognitive instruction. So what we're going to aim to do with our class-wide approaches today is build in, using a peer-mediated format, the motivation and metacognitive instruction and some other pieces as well to really try to capitalize on what we know about those evidence-based practices. So when we think about core instruction with uh, class-wide intervention as a part of it, we have to, of course, think about how are we structuring our core block anyway? What does that look like? And I've just given um, an example of 60-minute blocks. It may be that you don't have a 60-minute block, and that is absolutely fine. I'm just trying to give you a breakdown of how do you build in what um, we're going to put into as class-wide intervention. I have listed here as warm-up because I really like the idea of thinking about these class-wide interventions as a warm-up, because again, you're talking about these foundational skills that all students are missing. So the way we're gonna approach it is gonna be different, of course, than if students were acquiring a new skill. That's not the goal of what we're gonna do with these activities. And in some ways, it's ideal to think about these activities as a warm-up or first in your instructional block. Um, but again, this is something that you can talk about in your teams in terms of when you want to, to use this. So the idea here is that you have your 45 minutes of core instruction and you are permitting 15 minutes of your overall block for these warm up activities. So what may change in your own equation might not be the warm up activity because um, 10 to 15 minutes is about as trim as you can make it, um, but it might be the core instructional piece and how you're thinking about incorporating this into your overall structure. So we have this opportunity to think about class-wide instruction as part of a warm-up activity. We're going to address, as we already talked about, some key foundational skill gaps. But that means we have to think about what are those key foundational skill gaps? Because we do only have 10 to 15 minutes. We really want to make sure that we're utilizing this approach in the most efficient and effective way, which means we have to think about what are those foundational skills for 
um, my students or for your students that are going to be the most important to target. So you can think about that in your teams as what foundational skills are essential, what makes those foundational skills essential, what grade level benchmarks are critical that students must be able to leave with and not just acquire in the course of, of the, the year, but be fluent with and can generalize from. And then what are the common errors your class is making? So all three of those considerations can be helpful in thinking about what are the targets that we are going to have as part of this process? Another thing that I like to talk with teams about is talking to the next grade up teachers um, and saying, what do students not come to your grade with that you really need them to come with? So then you can make this not just about your own grade level experience, but also cross grade levels. And, you know, we certainly have lots of data um, at the national level to say, you know, middle school teachers would really love students to come with better word problem solving skills and be fluent with their facts. So um, what are those in your building? What are those grade up uh, skills that we you really want to make sure that you're able to send your students off with? <clears throat> We do have data, empirical data that can tell us or guide us for what we should be doing with our time. So the frequently cited math difficulties, um, this is a study that was done in 2000. It is still relevant today, and I uh, really appreciate that they did this work. Um, they talked to uh, educators and found um, the most frequently cited math difficulties from a large number of educators, and it was also mimicked by the empirical data that was illustrated in the National Math Advisory Panel Report from 2008. And so probably not surprising to all of you <clears throat> is that these are the frequently cited math difficulties. Um, it was solving word problems. It was multi-step procedural calculations. It was mathematics language, checking work and answers, automatic recall of basic facts, and fractions. <clears throat> and again, the data that I was just referring to a moment ago was from the National Math Advisory Panel, where they had conducted a survey of over a thousand algebra teachers who suggested that students generally needed better preparation um, with basic skills at the elementary level and specifically remarked that they were uh, um, not prepared to engage in word problems. The next thing, uh, the next piece of data that we can get is from, uh, this is from a national panel report, um, the National Mathematics Advisory Panel report from 2008, but also from an IES practice guide from 2009, which talked about what are the critical foundations for algebra. And the emphasis here is that KA instruction is oriented to making sure students can access algebra <clears throat> and preparing students to be able to engage in high level algebra. And as part of that, the three critical foundations that they identified were whole number proficiency, fluency with fractions, and then some key aspects of geometry, which include finding area, perimeter, and volume in some of the most basic ways. So as we think about this, I'm also uh, building the rationale for all of you for why we are focusing on whole number proficiency in our efforts for this class-wide intervention that you're going to try out. So that's our target is whole number proficiency. And I'm gonna show you some more data to illustrate why whole number proficiency is so important. And although we always knew it was important, we have some newer studies that have been conducted from um, basically 2015 till now on one of the uh, premier fraction uh, centers uh, at the University of Delaware. And they're providing us with a lot of information on how whole number proficiency is related to rational number knowledge. So that's our next topic, is what is this relationship between whole and rational number knowledge, and what do we know about it? So the studies that are listed below, they're from 2016 and on, and one of the most powerful statements that was made across these studies, and I wanted to pull that out for all of you, is that students with inadequate whole number knowledge were more likely to have trouble understanding fractions than students with adequate whole number knowledge. So in um, some of these studies, um, and one in particular, they set out to target 
rational number knowledge with sixth graders, and they discovered that they were unable to do so because students were not prepared to be in the position to focus on rational number knowledge because they had so many gaps in their whole number knowledge. And as a result of this and continuing work that this group of researchers has done, they've really emphasized the importance of proficiency with whole number knowledge. There's been a series of studies. I have, again, a, another set of this studies from similar authors at the bottom here that have suggested that whole number magnitude representations, as well as calculation fluency, and by calculation fluency, we mean fluency, including basic facts like multiplication, addition, division, and complex computation with both multiplication and division, understanding uh, place value in general. <clears throat> All of these things predict fraction knowledge. And then finally, <clears throat> this is a quote by he and colleagues from 2016, which says, our findings highlight the value of developing long division and multiplication skills for fraction learning. As such, it would be advantageous for students, especially those with weak whole number calculation skills, to continue practicing multiplication and division with whole numbers during the intermediate grades and even into middle school. So the recommendation here is that there hasn't been enough emphasis on building whole number proficiency sufficiently enough that students are prepared to engage in that rational number knowledge experiences once they get to that middle school time. <clears throat> so a graphic I like to, to think about is actually looking at our screening data, thinking about, okay, where are students falling with whole number and rational number knowledge? We're going to address whole number knowledge first, if that's a skill gap, and then we can move to the rational number knowledge skill gaps. And then within whole number knowledge, we're going to think about how are students doing with numeracy concepts or those conceptual pieces, number operations, and then word problem solving. And again, we are going to focus predominantly in our first eight-week trial here on number operations, both conceptual and procedural emphasis um, in that area to build that proficiency with whole numbers in the way that students can then be uh, hopefully better prepared to engage in that higher level math content based on what we know from the literature. <clears throat> so with that, <coughs> um, we can see that we need to have a focus on what we mean by building that whole number knowledge. So one of the things is to build fluency with math facts and complex computation. There's lots of data that's been illustrated over time to suggest that students in the United States do, do, um, do not have the same automaticity with basic facts that students in international countries do. We know that there are not enough opportunities to practice that are embedded in our curricula based on reviews of math, common math curricula that have existed. And we simply just don't build in the time for these opportunities. We know that there are 390 math facts, but we can make that um, a lot simpler to learn, right? Um, by thinking about and combining our conceptual understanding. And we also want students to be able to mentally perform some of these complex computation tasks, or at least know um, efficiently what strategy to use to solve these problems uh, as quickly and as efficiently and accurately as possible. We know from neurocognitive literature that automatic retrieval of basic facts is associated with higher general math performance. We have that data early in schooling, like first grade and third grade, and we also have that data among high school seniors. Um, so we can see that it's across this uh, entire schooling. One of the entry points is your basic fact fluency. We also know that students without fluent computation direct more cognitive resources to retrieving solutions than typical performing peers. And sometimes the barrier when we think about word problems or some of these higher level uh, math concept content areas is that students can actually solve the problem or uh, prepare to solve the problem up until the point they actually have to do the computation. And it's the computation where we see the breakdown. <clears throat> Um, I'd like to talk about uh, what the science says for opportunities to practice because there is a very new practice guide that came out in 2021, and it talks about assisting struggling students, but many of these practices are generally, and again, we're now talking about addressing skill gaps. So as we think about addressing skill gaps, we want to be able to do that by using those practices for those gap opportunities. And what we can see at number six here is that times Practice activities are an evidence-based practice. We have strong evidence for that. Um, and the example here 
that you can see on the right hand side of the screen under the what works clearinghouse box is that regularly included time activities is one important way to build fluency in mathematics. When we think about practice, um, we want to be thinking about deliberate productive opportunities that are required. This happens with all types of learning. Um, children and yourself may engage in sports and music um, and other activities, dance uh, and math is just like that. We need to know fundamentals and fundamentals are a, a common language, right? That's used in all these other activities, even with if you are an artist, it's all about these fundamentals that you always are routinely practicing and then building upon and utilizing in combinations to engage in that higher level content. And so I think our higher level skill. So I think that is a way that we should think about it. Um, similarly, when we talk about math. We also, with our opportunities to practice, want to promote active engagement with math content. We want students to be really engaging with those numbers and those concepts and thinking about them. We want to be able to provide high levels of feedback and support to students. And again, we want to make sure that some of those activities are timed practice opportunities so that, that we can promote efficient and accurate performance and improve student outcomes. It is pouring right now here, and I don't know if you can hear the rain in the background, but it is behind me. So I will try to make sure I'm talking loud enough. I also think as we talk about these opportunities to practice, it's really important to rethink what we mean by practice. So if you're thinking right now, well, what do I do for practice? How does practice operating? It's practice just based on homework? Are we having opportunities to practice in the classroom? It's really important to think about practice in a number of different ways. And I like to think about it in three ways, three um, specific aspects of practice. The first is guided practice. The second is timed practice. And then the third is cumulative review. With guided practice, this is when we're establishing skills. Students are establishing skills and we really are focusing on their accurate performance. Do they understand the concept? Can they do it accurate? Can they engage in the concept or skill accurately? That's guided practice. We want to use a lot of demonstration and modeling. We want to think out loud for students so they can hear what we're thinking and saying and how we're going through the process. And then we're going to talk about using worked and partially worked examples. And I'm going to provide more information on that later. We also want to have opportunities for timed practice. We want students to retain and maintain skills, and that's when we think about timing. So we also can consider that as when students are engaging in fluency building. This can be student-led activities like flashcards, worksheets, peer-mediated or team-based activities, and we can use technology in this space. And then we want to think about cumulative review. How do we make sure that these skills that students have established and retained are also going to endure over time and can be taken apart and used to build um, new concepts. So we want to make sure that we're building in gains, challenge problems, and interleaved opportunities for practice. So I'll go back here. My slide advanced on me without me advancing it. So I'll give you a second to think about all of these types of practice and how do we embed these already in your classroom? And we're going to talk about strategic ways that we can embed them in your class-wide intervention. <clears throat> okay, the rain died down a little bit here, so that's good. Okay, so that was a big buildup to why class-wide intervention and a little bit on uh, some of the pieces of class-wide intervention that are gonna be important to build into your structure. <clears throat> The next thing is thinking about what are class-wide interventions. <clears throat> the goals of class-wide interventions, as I've already alluded to, you probably have caught on, are really to build fluency with those core foundational skills. And we're going to do that by increasing the number of opportunities students have for practice and the amount and type of feedback that we're going to be building into those practice opportunities that students are going to be able to receive. The goal of a class-wide intervention, once again, is to improve the average class performance. So we know that not all students are going to respond to your class-wide intervention. But we also know from the data that I described earlier that we will be able to identify more accurately the students that do need those additional supports by using this class-wide intervention. So in other words, we're gonna capture a number of students whose skills have fallen behind by using this class-wide intervention. Um, and then we're gonna better accurately be able to tell 
which students are really in need of that additional support. So it, there's a win-win here. And then what is also super important as you think about, again, what is the structure of your core block look like is embedding this into naturally occurring classroom routines. This needs to be something that makes sense for your classroom routine so that it's easy for everybody to engage it. It's easy for you to make sure it happens. It's easy for the students to know the routine. So it's important to think about building this into your classroom as a way that makes sense for your already naturally occurring classroom routines. When we specifically talk about using classroom intervention in this way, and I think at the um, four to six age range, we're still thinking about it in this tier 1.5. It looks different if we're starting to think about grades seven through 12. So we're gonna really think about this as looking at your class median. So if, if, if um, you are on your building team or you're having someone come in and say um, externally and you weren't part of this project, we would start by looking at your universal screener and see if class medians are falling on the universal screener below the 25th percentile. Those would be the classrooms we wanted to target for using peer assisted learning. For your purposes, um, you are going to just identify those skill gaps. And I've done, uh, you'll see in a minute, that I've preset some skill gaps that I think might be useful. Um, you'll have the opportunity to review those with your team and see if what I thought about made sense for you. Then you're gonna provide a brief 10 minute intervention. The actual intervention itself is 10 to 15 minutes. Um, when you think about all of the things that go into transition and starting, at the beginning, it's gonna take longer. As you get more efficient with your routine, it will be shorter. So you can even think about this as a 10 to 20 minute buffer at the beginning, probably 20 minutes, and then you can work down to those 10 minutes. <clears throat> and again, as we already pointed out, um, we want to increase opportunities to practice skills and concepts and increase the amount and type of feedback provided. And these are on skills students have already had explicit um, systematic instruction with. So these are not new skills that we're targeting. These are those fundamental skills that are those prerequisites that students need to really know well. So the next thing to think about is what actually are the benefits of engaging in this peer assisted model? Um, there are lots of ways to engage in team based structures and peer based structures. Sometimes um, they may not work. So how do we use peer assisted learning in a way that is the most successful? So there have been a number, a large number of meta analyses on the benefits of peer assisted learning across different academic subjects and within math. Students that work in pairs or small groups daily even scored higher on the NAEP 2017 data than um, their peers that did not. So this is pretty interesting and this was particularly talking about grade eight students that came out of a question that was asked within the NAEP 2017 data. So um, I think that's pretty interesting that we have even grade eight students where we're suggesting that pairs or small groups daily resulted in higher performance <clears throat> overall on, on a big achievement measure. We know that peer assisted learning um, <clears throat> benefits students from low income and minoritized backgrounds in urban schools as well as English learners. One of the biggest challenges in identifying evidence-based practices is that often our practices are only middle, representing middle-class middle class white students. Um, that's who have been represented in the literature, but in peer-assisted learning, we have had diverse samples of students and have able to see the benefits across different and diverse students. We know um, that there are some non-academic benefits too. So we know that students do better when they are monitoring their own outcomes with peer assisted learning, when they set their own goals and they evaluate their own performance. In other words, we build in that self-regulated learning practice. And um, we also know that there's more evidence benefiting this peer assisted learning activities for whole number concepts. The non-math benefits are related to social skills. There's a huge social skill benefit um, to peer assisted learning that comes from working in these pairs. So there's a lot of opportunities to um, have both math related gains and just general um, good social skill gains too, coming from the use of these peer assisted activities. 
But as you can see here, there's also some caveats. It's better when we have students monitor when students are monitoring their own outcomes, <clears throat> when they are engaging in some kind of goal reflection or setting, and when they're evaluating their own performance to see their own gains. So involving that self-regulation piece. So there are uh, peer assisted learning steps. I'm going to walk you through each of those steps, and then we're going to model those steps and see how that's going to look for your teams specifically. So the first step is you have to select the activity and you have to set the time. So I kind of I already said to you it really should be 15 minutes with this 10 to 20 minute buffer with 20 minutes um, at the beginning. It's probably 10 minutes as you get really used to this uh, practice and it's part of your regular routine. Um, I have pre-selected some activities for you and we'll review them and then you can review them in teams. You're going to pair students. You're going to make sure that you've provided background and reviewed key concepts and procedures that students need to understand in order to use these peer assisted uh, practice activities. You're going to identify rules for the students to work together. You're going to create a team scorecard. Um, so you will have choices here in what you want that to be, how scripted you want the team scorecard to be, or do you want it to be more general? Those are choices that you can make as a team. You want to have pairs have uh, daily goals or weekly goals. I've actually proposed a goal reflection idea, but you can make those choices in your team as well. You're going to have students be assigned um, to begin as what we call tutor or coach. So often the language used, this is a reciprocal peer tutoring model, which means everyone has a chance to be the coach, everyone has a chance to be the player, or everyone has a chance to be the tutor, everyone has a chance to be the 2D. Um, I like coach and player, so you'll see that I use that terminology throughout. And that came from um, Pukes and colleagues. They have a peer assisted learning package. And so uh, that's where that coach and player comes from. And um, number eight is you're going to make sure you have a timer to signal role switching. So there's going to be five minutes of opportunity to practice with an activity as coach and five minutes as player. And then there's a wrap up. So you want students to evaluate their teamwork going back with to number four. How are they working together and their um, specific goal reflections or goals that they have set for themselves? So those are the nine steps that we're going to work on uh, throughout our morning. So what I'm going to do is walk through specifically each of these steps and the activities that I pre-established for this, um, this initial trial that you are all participating in. So with this initial trial, we have this select activity. And so what I did is try to um, take advantage of those three types of practice opportunities and build that into these activities. So we have some opportunities for flashcards. We have opportunities for the use of worksheets. Um, and we have opportunities for review activities. So I've structured those into your um, specific activities and they'll come at a particular time. And, and I have a calendar overview for you so you can see how I've organized into those activities. <clears throat> um, one of the reasons that I've pre-selected those activities is because I'm thinking about some key concepts that we wanna target based on what we just discussed a few moments ago in terms of what are our good evidence-based practices? So again, when we're thinking about building computational fluency, we want to make sure students have high levels of accuracy. So you um, are going to have more variability than probably we often target when it comes to this 90% this accuracy. But think about it. If your entire class is really um, inaccurate with a particular skill, and especially when you look at my recommended list of, of skill targets, um, then you're not going to want to assign that activity as part of this peer mediated task. You're going to need to wait until students are more accurate and then you can use it as this task. So we really want students to have 90% accuracy so that they can engage in it right independently because they're doing this with each other and not with not with, not with a, a teacher. So we want that skill to be a skill that needs fluency building. We um, can do a number of different things when we're building computational fluency. Um, technology, cooperative groups, response cards, we're using that peer mediated approach. Um, we are also not using technology, we are using flashcard worksheets and review games. So I'm just giving you some backdrop on how you build computational fluency and the rationale for why we selected or I selected the uh, recommended activities that I'm providing you with. 
we also want to make sure students have backup strategies. So with fluency building, we're assuming that students have some good conceptual understanding. Oh, my things now says 85% accuracy. I, I fluctuate between 85 and 90%, but I do think aiming for that 90% is better. Um, so when we think about these backup strategies, if we were thinking about um, multiplication, for example, we would want students to know how to do skip counting, repeated addition, know your doubles first, um, build an array, use known facts first. And these are all conceptual pieces that are necessary for students to engage in fluent responding. And if they make errors, we want them to go back to those conceptual pieces so they can solve the problem. Um, we want students to also be able to apply commutative and distributive properties. And you'll see that in the materials that I've created, especially when we talk about complex computation, that we are including these types of tasks as warm of our backup. And we want to make sure that students already know how to use these pretty well and know how to when to apply them and do it with accuracy before we ask them to do it in pairs. So these are just two examples of applying that commutative and distributive property that we can build into our activities. So that's on how we build computational fluency, which is part of, again, our goal with these class-wide activities. The next one is interleaving worked examples. So my question for you to think about rhetorically is which approach uh, of the two that I'm gonna ask you about will lead to better learning? And um, you can think to yourself, what is that answer? Uh, what do I think it is? So the first choice is asking for solutions to all eight problems, which means you're presenting the students with a problem and they just are answering it in a typical way. And the second um, option is, or do we interleave four worked examples with four problems? So the worked example is an example where the entire problem is already worked out and the student and the pairs, um, as would be the case with classified intervention, will work through or talk through that works example first, and then they will do a similar problem. So which one leads to better learning? That's the question. So answer that for yourself. So this is our standard problem. And um, the one that I just popped up that's on the right hand part of your screen is the worked problem. So the answer is interleaving four worked problems with four standard problems. So that results in better learning. So we are going to make sure that our tasks that we are using for complex computation are building in some of these worked examples. And so here is the data from What Works Clearinghouse. This is another one of those practice guides. You'll hear me talk a lot about practice guides. I really appreciate them. They are a conglomeration of all the research evidence from uh, that have been reviewed by interdisciplinary panels. Um, and so the research has shown that students typically learn more deeply and more easily when examples are interleaved between problems. And we have some moderate evidence for this. And of course, this is actually an older practice guide. So when they go back and review it, there's probably even more evidence now to illustrate that this is the case. We typically think of um, just those um, blocked practice opportunities as sort of this other example. Um, blocked practices, you get the same type of problem over and over and over. Um, so there are a couple of different ways we can think about interleaving. Interleaving can be the worked and not worked, as I mentioned before, and interleaving also can be part of our cumulative review, where we provide a couple of skills together that students have learned, and students need to alternate solving those problems. So you could embed um, multi-digit multiplication as well as multi-digit uh, division together in, in an um, activity. So interleaving has two different foci or, or ways that we talk about it. And we're going to try to build both of those into our activities. The last evidence-based practice that um, I talked about earlier was self-regulation. So we want students to become aware of how they think when problem solving. A lot of us talk about the term growth mindset, and I like to think of growth mindset from probably its origin, which was really in this larger umbrella of self-regulation or self-moderated um, or, or metacognition, all of these terms to me, um, and I'm sure there are definitely nuances among them, so I recognize that I am um, maybe overgeneralizing, but all of those terms to me refer to a similar thing, which is helping students become aware of how 
they think when engaging in problem solving. So using heuristics and mnemonics and verbalization, which is what automatically starts to happen with a peer mediated task, um, to teach students how to plan, monitor, and modify their own work. And if you remember, when we talked about some of the um, key areas that teachers identified as being most challenging, it is checking work and correcting work. So it's, that's part of this whole um, self-regulated plan. So one of the simplest ways to do this is to build in a self-monitoring checklist. So if we go also back to a slide I mentioned earlier, which is how do you think about the skills that you're going to address, those fundamental skills that you want to address through peer-mediated um, class-wide intervention? We said that you could look at error patterns. So one thing to do if you have identified common error patterns across your classroom is actually create a checklist from those common errors making each of those errors a specific step in a checklist that can be used to prevent errors. So I, I think I've added a couple of checklists in here as examples for uh, materials that you can use in your own peer mediated classroom tasks. This is a very simple one. It again, comes from the IRIS Center. Um, it is um, you know, very basic. So this is too basic for what you're going to need, but it gives you an example of what this checklist might look like. So these checklists can be individualized, but of course our goal is not to have those to be individualized. We want them to be broad for the whole class. So we are going to include those common errors. We're gonna list an appropriate step for each error prevention, compile each self um, check item into a list. These can be put uh, laminated, they can be put, they can be made into small little cards, they can be in a key rings, or they can be larger checklists that um, can, you can use dry erase markers with on those laminated cards. So all of that was number one, pick the activity. So I wanted to give you enough sufficient background for what activities we are going to pick and why we are picking them. So it makes sense to you when you start to look at the materials. Number two is pair students. So it's reciprocal pairing, which is what I had mentioned earlier. Each student will be coach and player. The most common way to pair students, and this is something that you'll have to consider in your teams this morning, um, is to pair the higher performing students with the lower performing students and the middle range students are paired together. Um, and then you're gonna need to decide, do you wanna keep those pairs together for the entire trial that you have this fall? Or do you wanna alternate pairs in some fashion? Do you wanna alternate them weekly or biweekly or monthly? How is that gonna work for you? Number three, uh, we had already highlighted before, which is it's really important to provide background um, information for these students to just preview uh, their background knowledge and review their background knowledge, as well as key concepts and procedures that students may need. Um, so for example, strategies for basic multiplication, you can see a thinking card that I had um, generated for all of you to use. You can see, um, we'll have decomposition maths um, that I've created as examples, standard algorithm, distributive property, community property, the, what's the relationship between addition and subtraction, for example. So all of these are gonna be some key background concepts that we want students to make sure they understand before they're engaging in these activities together. We wanna identify rules for working together, as I mentioned. And so um, there are lots of different examples and I think it's important for you to generate the examples that make the most sense um, based on the work that you're doing and your students. Uh, these are just some examples. So talk only to my partner, talk only about math, be helpful and be kind. Uh, any variation of rules that makes sense for your students works. And I guess the rule here is we wanna have three to five, so not too many. You can create your team scorecard. And I think there's a lot of ways that you can be flexible here on what makes sense for you. And I did not dictate that in the materials. That's something that I think all of you can work on um, as a group and decide within your own teams what makes the most sense. So what is commonly used in some of these more scripted um, historical peer um, tutoring type activities is you have a checklist with the rules and you just walk around the room and um, monitor. Uh, students engaging in those rules that you just created, those rules of engagement, and then provide stamps or stickers when students are doing so um, and making sure that they are engaging in the steps properly. Another option is to use a good behavior game. I, um, I've used the good behavior game in a number of different ways, um, but at the class-wide level, <clears throat> the good behavior game can be um, teams can compete with each other. 
um, for are they following the rules? I like to do it with a positive spin. Sometimes the good behavior game is used um, if you know students get marks if they are engaging in inappropriate behavior. I prefer to do it as the positive alternative, which is every time teams do the thing that we want them to do, we're marking it on the board. Um, or you can do a whole class versus teacher kind of thing where every time um, the students are engaging in the appropriate behavior, they get a point. If they don't, then you get a point as the teacher. So that's kind of a hybrid between the two um, approaches. So there's lots of different ways that you can do this. But again, this team scorecard is the most common where you just kind of walk around. It allows you to monitor each of the peers, uh, pairs, and then you can, um, you know, stamp that they, they're doing a good job. <clears throat> Number six is have pairs um, or individuals select daily or weekly goals. In thinking about this, I uh, propose to you a goal reflection sheet. Again, this is something that you can change based on your students and what you prefer to do, what already exists maybe in your classroom structure or in your school structure. So um, thinking about a goal reflection sheet, talking about learning goals and improving their progress monitoring scores, students will have a pre and a post test um, for their own knowledge at each week of the um, trial that we're using in the fall. And so they will be able to see their performance. And then they also can think about their performance in the moment with the dyad, um, thinking about how they're able to reflect upon the math that they're doing, as well as reflect upon being a good coach and player. Number seven is we're going to, of course, assign students to begin as coach or player. So um, you can randomly assign students each day to start as coach. You can have you can pick names out of a hat to start, or you can do a switch every other day. So any of those choices are good ones. And again, that's something that you want to think about in your teams today uh, in terms of which one makes most sense for you. The timer is fairly easy, but I thought this was a good opportunity to talk about the overall structure. So we can see that um, we're going to begin with the teacher demonstration and modeling. If you want to just provide the couple minutes of background information, make sure students all know how they're starting and using the activity, make sure it's going to be utilized properly. Um, that you know, aside from the peer practice, you're, you're going to have a whole session where you just work on peer, um, peer process, but this is just the math content. So you want to have, you do that first, then you're going to have the first five minutes with the roles assigned as coach and player. Then after five minutes, you're going to switch. So kitchen timers are great here, or if you have a bell that you can use at the, for everyone to switch at the same time. So anything will work um, to signal that switch. And then at the end, um, collect those materials. Um, we're going to have a step where students, um, a couple of times, so two times a week, students will be scoring their own progress monitoring probe. So that will happen before you collect materials. And then finally, it's wrap up. Reflect on how well students follow the rules for working together, administer rewards. So as we talked about that good behavior game and the scorecards, you can build in rewards if you need to. Again, that's a choice you can make. Um, you can review those daily goals or the goal reflection sheets. And then you can talk about weekly goals, but those are typically only reviewed on Friday after progress monitoring has occurred. So this wrap up and evaluate teamwork and goals is going to be specific to what you decide according to that scorecard um, and that goal process that you want to use. So we're going to close this kind of opening why and what um, are our class-wide interventions by talking about adaptations. So I feel like these adaptations might be a little premature, but it's to get you thinking about what can you do that you're not just stuck in using a formula, that there are many different ways that you can make this work if things are breaking down, or if you see it works for a while, but then it's starting to not work. So what do we do to make some changes? So um, I'm gonna talk you through a couple of those so that they're just in your back pocket. So one is to think about if students are close to mastery of the particular skill, you want to increase the salience of feedback, add goals and rewards. We, I've kind of already provided a structure for you where that's built in, but that's how you can think about this if you think about students' learning needs. If students are struggling to grasp the content, then as I mentioned earlier, you really want to scale back and work with prerequisite skills 
and or really make use of those self-monitoring checklists. And then if student engagement is a problem, you can add options for choice, rewards, um, reconsider how much information is presented on the worksheets or, or the other materials that you're providing. Um, other things that you can do is have word problem extensions where each pair turns computation problems into word problems and then they exchange them and solve. We've talked about checklists. Card games, I have built in a couple of games that are related to cards. So um, you'll see that in, in the materials. We've talked about goal reflection. We've talked about group contingencies. So class competes to earn the highest median score, or you can do um, if everybody um, is filled out their team scorecard and um, everyone seems to be engaged in the process, then everybody can earn you know, points towards a class reward. Uh, alternating materials, I've, I've naturally built into the um, example materials that we're gonna start with. Choice, um, the teacher can select five problems, the students must practice, and then students can choose five problems. There's lots of different ways to build in choice. That's just one example. Um, and then interspersing different skills. So I right now have built for you a structure that has one skill each week. Um, but you might decide eventually that you want to alternate those practice days between basic and complex operations or different types of complex operations. So that's a choice as well. So I just um, highlighting here the ones that we already are uh, I've already built into the trial. Okay. <clears throat> so this has been our first hour. So what I thought we would do is um, pause here. I'm happy to answer any questions we have now. Um, and I can do that through the chat um, or we can, yeah, we can do that through the chat. And then, um, and then we'll come back and we're gonna talk about actually building your class-wide intervention. So I'll pause here or you can unmute yourself and just ask a question aloud as well. Hi, I have a question. Yes. Can you, okay. So um, way back early on, you talked about time testing. Yes. Are you talking things like mad minutes? Because I thought I've read a lot of research that said that those actually don't help in, increase student mastery of, of their facts. Um, or are you just talking about timed activities that students do? Um, timed activities in general, and I didn't build in a ton of timed activities actually is the case, but the um, the data is actually very positive that timed activities, including time tasks, maybe not structured exactly like mad minutes, um, are very result in very positive outcomes for students, including those students with math anxiety. So do you, could you um, cite some researchers I could go check out? Yes, so the, if you go to the IES practice guide, um, that I had mentioned earlier, I can actually, I can um, find that for you and put that in the chat uh, during the break. You can see all of the synthesis of research that was done by that interdisciplinary panel, and then they will cite different studies that have included time to practice activities. Okay, and then I have one other question. Yep. It goes with um, grouping. So the, the grouping research for gifted students says that we shouldn't be grouping a high kid with a low kid um, because it, it, the, un, the low child will underperform and the high kid is, is just high. So when you're talking about grouping a high and a low student, can you just be more specific about what, what you're talking about? Yeah, in the class-wide um, peer-mediated models, this this is the structure that has worked and has produced that um, you know myriad of studies that has all these positive outcomes. It is always the case that you pair the high student with the low student because you, both students benefit. They benefit from being the coach and the player. Sometimes the benefit comes from being the player. Sometimes the benefit comes from being the coach, and sometimes it comes from both. Okay. So in that structure. Um, that particular um, notion that you're talking about does not apply. So you're talking about in the structure of those activities, not in the regular structure of the classroom. In Right, in the structure of the peer mediated activities, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yep, thank you for your questions.
Okay, so there's another question I didn't see the checklist. So I just provided a couple of checklists in two areas as examples, um, but I really think it can be helpful for you to think about as a team, like where do you think you need checklists for what skills? So um, let me, Christina, during the break, I will go through my, um, my, so anyway, I had to, I had all of these things separated out for you, but I, uh, because of the platform, I had to combine a lot of the content together. So I just have to go through which week I added those checklists as examples, and then I can give that information to you. Other questions that I can answer? Yeah. Um, okay, so um, Jennifer was asking me, can I clarify that this is only for classes with a class median below the 25th percentile? And I probably gave you too much background information that's not helpful. Um, what we look at with our screener, sometimes if we're thinking about building this in as a school-wide task, we start with, okay, well, who definitely needs to have the class-wide target? And if we're thinking about it from a school-wide perspective, that's where that 25th percentile came in. I don't think it any applies anymore given our current context. So I know that as I have um, worked with some schools, I've worked with students in a summer camp this year um, we, that we have on campus that I co-direct, we are seeing tons of skill gaps. And so I think that original structure that I was referring to with the 25th percentile and how do you think about class-wide intervention when you're building a school-wide schedule is something that probably applied pre-COVID. And I was just kind of giving you the structure of how we have historically thought about that. But I think in our circumstances, based on all of the information we have on students that are going to come in with math difficulties already, plus the skill gaps that we know existed because of our alternative schooling plans that we really can just, you can ignore that and you wanna just focus on what are the gaps that you're seeing in the students that you have with you. And I pre-identified gaps and we'll see this in the next segment because you're gonna go through all the materials in more depth and I'm gonna explain them first to you so you understand what you're looking at. Um, but one of the really important things is there are some key critical gaps that I think are typically missing. And so that's what I built our, our one month trial on, but you can make some modifications if you're seeing something very specific in your classrooms. Okay, other questions? And again, you can unmute yourself um, or you can put it in the chat. Okay, so for this 15-minute um, break, I will make sure that I put into the chat the link to the IES practice guide, and I will find for you where I have um, specifically listed those checklists. So we will be coming back at 9.55. All right, welcome back. So hopefully you've had some time to reflect upon the conversation that we had earlier. We are going to now get into really talking about what are the materials that you have available to you and how are you going to structure this in your teams? And you'll have ample opportunity to actually go into breakout groups and work with those teams and then come back um, and we can address questions there. So, uh, this next section is building your class-wide intervention. So the plan, um, as I had alluded to earlier, before we left for break, was um, I created based on what I perceive to be some of the skill gaps that are operating. However, there's I recognize there's fourth, fifth, and sixth grades that are being targeted here. So you may go back to your teams and say, okay, <clears throat> we'd like to do one through three, but um, maybe we don't do seven and eight, or you might say we need to do more with um, seven and eight, some more um, gradation there. 
um, more prerequisite skills. So maybe we're going to map this out a little bit differently. But um, I do think that this um, eight week structure can be used for all of your grades with them um, maybe tweaking for each of you. So that is this is the sample template and there are materials built for each of these weeks according to, to these schedules. Um, I started with multiplication basic facts, and I know the focus area is complex computation, but the re reason and rationale is that many students do not have um, fluency with their basic multiplication facts, and it will make everything else they do that's harder in this complex computation area um, a challenge. So that's where we started, and I started it in a really uh, strategic way where students are focusing on just certain facts for certain days. And so we actually have a two week structure here. So this is designed to be um, approximately eight weeks, September 26th through December 2nd. Weeks one and two are multiplication facts. Week three is multiplication and division fact families. Week four is two by two digit addition uh, with regrouping. Uh, everything's with regrouping. So that's a, a modification that you can make. You may not want to have regrouping um, and have something with multi-digit without regrouping. Um, week five is two by two digit subtraction with regrouping. Week six is the combination of the two. Uh, week seven is two by one and two by two digit multiplication with regrouping. And week eight is three by two or three by three digit multiplication. You might also wanna modify this by saying, hey, we really wanna do um, multi-digit addition to the thousands, that's fine too. You can make those adaptations and hopefully I've given you enough materials and formatting that you can structure um, this how you need to. So that's the content. Then the way it's organized, if we look at this calendar, you can see the topic for 926 is multiplication. Um, day one is the pretest. So you'll see that consistently if we look at day one and go down. Um, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but I'm just scrolling my arrow down from week one to week eight. All of them have the pretest. And then on the very first day, you're just going to practice that structure with the students following the um, rules of engagement and making sure that they can engage in the task. You can really use anything for that. Um, you can do multiplication problems, zeros through uh, zeros and ones if you wanted to do that. So just something easy um, in this initial day, the main point is that students understand how they work through this um, dyad practice. Then you can see I have um, flashcards practiced um, twos and fours, threes and sixes, fives and tens. And then on Friday, uh, also consistent across the weeks will be progress monitoring. So there isn't a peer tutoring dyad during that time. We're just going to progress monitor. Um, I will talk to you a little bit about what that progress monitoring piece will look like. I have created those um, pre-test, post-test for you um, for each week for the skills that are on this um, calendar. And I will tell you how I made them so that if you want to modify what this table is, you can make them as well. Um, <clears throat> then you can see in week two multiplication, we also have review activities built in. Um, in week three, for example, we have um, cover, copy, compare with backed families, which are specific worksheets, and I'll tell you where I've um, gotten those from, and I'll show you what that looks like in your file. Um, and then we have some division activities. You can see we are, um, I have built in here variation in weeks four, five, or well, four through eight of um, standard algorithm and decomposition activities. Um, expanded form is included in those worksheets you'll see. But again, those are things that you can change based on what you are using in your systems as well. Um, and then the progress monitoring tools are not as precise as the skill we're targeting for the complex computation. And that's just because of the limitations we have in building those outcome measures. So I'll explain more about that when we talk about the data later. Um, this is your peer tutoring adherence checklist and protocol. So all of the basics on peer tutoring can be found in that first uh, PDF file. That first PDF file says um, something about class-wide instruction, class-wide intervention instructions. So this, you'll find this checklist in there. Um, the goal here is to follow the master schedule with um, any adaptations that you decided to make as a team. Uh, teaches students how to use peer tutoring protocols using role plays or demonstrations. So that's the first week of the first first day of the first week. 
um, or if students have trouble later on and need a reminder. You're going to pretest students using the first progress monitoring probe at the start of each week. You're going to have students set goals for performance. And so this is where I said, see the reflection sheet. If you want to use that sheet or you want to adapt that sheet, that's up to you and your team. Um, for each math activity, so again, cover, copy, compare, guided worksheets, flashcards, um, you want to model and demonstrate on the first day of each week how the coaches and players will engage with the activity. And again, any background knowledge that's needed, you would provide. You're going to develop three to five rules for peer tutoring that coaches and players will follow, and you want to check each dyad each session and provide feedback on those rules. And then you're going to post test students using the second progress monitoring probe that I've given you at the end of the week. Or in the case of that first multiple basic fact multiplication block, it'll be at the end of two weeks. And then um, eight is have students revisit their goal reflection sheet. So that's the basic checklist that you're going to follow. Those are the basic procedures. <clears throat> I've created two protocols or what we might call peer tutor cards. One is for flashcards. Um, and so this describes what their process will be to, um, to them. And so you can see here, they're given instructions. Um, they are told they'll have be able to take turns. Someone will be the coach and the player. They'll have five minutes to do each. And it gives the roles for the coach and the player. Again, you can adapt these if you'd like to adapt them. These are the ones that I've used in the past. Um, it's important that students are providing positive um, words to, to their peer and in, understand how to address error corrections as well. So that's one of the things that you're going to want to watch for on the very first session. And again, with this um, flashcards, it talks to them um, for using those backup strategies so that the students can solve the problem if they don't know it automatically. And there is a thinking card built in week one that they can refer to. Um, there's a second one. I thought maybe I had put the um, worksheet one in here. I did not. There is an exact um, replica of this peer tutor card for the worksheets. And the instructions are a little bit different because students are walking through a worksheet as opposed to using flashcards. But otherwise, it is very much the same in terms of the roles that students will have. So again, these are things that you can print out or have laminated. So that's up to you on how you, or you can make a poster of what the steps are. So that's up to you on how you want to display those um, protocols for the students. Um, here is just some examples of what I provided for the rules of engagement. So again, I use those same four that I talked about earlier, and that's in your packet that says class-wide um, instruction, intervention instructions. And then the goal reflection sheet is list or name the parts of the skill you are confident with, list or name the parts of the skill you want to get better with. And I mean, you can put anything in here. That was just one example of what you could do that's simple um, and kind of fits in the time frame that we have. This is an example of pack of, I'm going to give you a couple different packets, uh, examples, so that when you go to the materials, you can feel like you're oriented already to what is in those packets. So in the class, what instruction is going to be your integrity checklist, the um, peer tutor cards as well. Um, in the packets will just be the materials for peer tutoring. And if there are specific background um, instructions that I thought maybe would be good to highlight, I put that in your weekly packet as well. So the class-wide instructions is the overarching things that you need every week, goal reflection sheets, peer engagement sheets, and then the um, packets for each week are specific to the content area and the schedule. Um, so I provided, for example, this thinking strategy chart, uh, multiplication bingo chart, which is one of those review games. Um, and then what you're seeing last over here is that says basic fact worksheet is actually the pre-test, post-test progress monitoring probe. It's what they, those look like. This one, um, well, they all came from Math Fact Cafe, and I'll talk about that in a little in a little bit. So this gives you a sample. There is more than just bingo. There's a couple of games in here. Um, for these first couple of weeks. What I did not provide for weeks one and two is the flashcards. 
This is an example of a packet for week four. And again, you can change um, any of these worksheets based on the models that you typically utilize. I just use models that I have used in the past. So um, feel free to make modifications. So what I've given you is this multi-digit edition guided practice worksheet, which um, asks students to estimate, and then it uses the standard algorithm. It includes those worked problems that we talked about, and then it includes um, partially worked problems and then an unworked problem. So this is actually very great grade uh, graduated in terms of how students use it. So they talk about the worked problem, then together they work on the partial problem, and then the um, player would work on the independent problem. Um, this is a decomposition map that we have built for a, a different program that we have. Um, myself and John Begany, you can see the copyright on the bottom. It's a decomposition map. Um, so that's uh, an, another activity that has been built in. And then you can see the progress monitoring probe here. Uh, this is the answer key that you have here. So there's answer keys for all of the, the progress monitoring probes because we want the students to score their own um, worksheets and make those corrections to them while they are um, looking at their performance. So all of those things are provided for you. And that's an example of week four. If we look at your Google file, um, you can see here that um, the class-wide intervention instructions with the overarching material that I just mentioned are in the one document. Then you have, we're going to skip the arrows for a second. Um, then you have week one, two, three, four through eight down here. Um, and then <clears throat> we have these cover copy compare worksheets. These all came from mind.org, which I have a slide on as well, so you can access that yourself. Um, but th those would not um, embed because probably they came from this website. They would not embed into these other PDF documents. So they are listed separately and they are intended for weeks six, seven, and eight. So um, their content should match. So you can see addition and subtraction goes with week six, which is mixed uh, multi-digit addition and subtraction. And then the multiplication um, forms are for weeks seven and eight. So I mentioned that I wanted you to know where I created some of these resources so that if you want to make modifications or have different uh, a different schedule of the content areas that I created, you can do that. Math Facts Cafe is where you can create the um, custom pretest, post-test probes. I can give you specific instructions on how to do that if that's something that you decide in your teams that you would like to do, and I will add that um, to your materials on how to do that. Usually we recommend um, <clears throat> that there's about 45 to 60 problems so that students can't finish um, in the time that we have allocated because then we won't know actually how well they can do. So we want to have more problems than they, than they can get to in that time frame. Um, and then MIND is where we grabbed a lot of um, the cover copy compare worksheets. They are already pre-formatted for you. So I know if you're interested in looking at the thousands for some of these multi-digit skills, um, they have some of those in worksheets here. Um, so that's where I found them. So the, we're at the point where I want us to get to our first breakout. Hopefully you have enough background and enough orientation to the materials that you can start looking through the materials and thinking about um, a couple of things. So the first things that I want you to actually focus on um, is looking at those class-wide intervention instructions. And I want this breakout just to be about that. Um, and we'll have another breakout talking specifically about your week-to-week -week schedule. Um, so, First, overall, what do you think about the schedule? Is there anything you want to change in terms of the content? Second, what will the rules of engagement be? Um, and what do you want the goal reflection or goal setting to look like? I also want you to think about how are you going to make your pairs um, and all of those specific logistics related to doing the peer tutoring. So that's why I just want you to focus on this particular packet that says class-wide intervention instructions and think about the things that you um, want, to just look through it. How do you want to do it? What are the things you want to change in terms of maybe rules of engagement or goal reflection and then potentially any content? And so we are going to give you about 30 minutes um, to do that. So we'll come back around 1040 
and we can answer questions at that point in time. So I want you to have this opportunity to really be able to go through that initial set of instructions and, um, and talk through how you want it to look. Um, think about goal, thinking about goal reflections. Sorry, Jared, I, I jumped the recording. Um, and um, now is a good opportunity to discuss any questions that came up. We did have a few come up in the interim, so I don't mind starting with those questions. Um, one of them was, you know, how strict is the schedule? And I was just trying to um, kind of get the the best middle schedule I could get for the grade levels, but I certainly recognize, and that's why I wanted you to have this opportunity to discuss as a team, that, for example, your students may not be ready for uh, basic multiplication and you want to do addition and subtraction instead. That's fine. And I can also, some of those review activities that I had built for multiplication, I can just send later and drop in your, um, your Google file or send to um, patents to drop in the Google file some variations of those materials if you wanted to start with addition, for example. Um, and then again, if you wanted to change the sequence of that multi-digit structure, that's fine too. It should match what you are seeing and what you need in your system. So that was a question that came up. And then um, how I organized the flashcards was another question. And I, I specifically organized them so there are some conceptual matches with this the um, focus facts, if you will, for those days, as well as I wanted to narrow the content. So that's why those are organized in the way that they are. And then I think I, the third thing that came up um, in the interim was what happens if there are holidays and um, you, you don't get that five day sequence. And I, and I certainly think it's fine to extend the scale over, I think, what I suggested is that we extend the skill over that second week as opposed to shortening the time on that skill. And um, we'll see how that goes. You can reflect back on how that will go. So now, um, before I send you back to your rooms for more questions uh, or more discussion, um, I thought we could open this up to other questions that maybe came up that I did not just address. I'm going to go ahead and unmute. I'm sorry. Hi, Carrie. Hi, Carrie. Um, <laughs> our question that we were discussing was, you know, at the end of the week, um, is there a level of proficiency or mastery that we're looking for, whether it's a growth in digits correct or a percentage that have reached a certain criteria before moving on to the next week? We just felt like, um, especially like that week two, seven, eights, nines, we felt like that for our students would probably extend into a, a second week yeah. and what your thoughts were on that. I think extending, I think this needs to be made for your, um, what you see in your building. I was, um, like I mentioned, trying to just hit the middle on what um, I know is typically problematic, but that doesn't mean it's problematic for your students. And you're absolutely right. The um, seven, eight, nines, I think are the hardest multiple, there's actual data, empirical data to show those are the hardest um, facts to learn. I will talk about that, uh, the data piece after our, these discussions. I have given some general guidelines for the basic fact fluency that is based on the empirical data. Um, for the multi-digit or complex computation, it's just, did I do better than a pretest? Um, and because there is no empirical data on that, I didn't want to set a specific standard. So the standard is just that the students were able to improve. Um, and then there are different ways that we're going to look at the data depending on the skill. So the simple skill will just be digits correct, as you had suggested, and the um, complex skill will be percent uh, accurate as well as total digits. So we will talk about that um, in the latter part of our conversation today. Great questions. Thank you. Um, in terms of the goals, so I think, uh, so I, there's a question in the chat that says, who sets the goals? I think um, that's something that I wanted you guys and your teams to decide what is the typical practice in your setting? Is there a typical practice? I liked the idea of the goal reflection sheet to, to leave it more open. You could add a goal at the bottom that the students set. Oops, sorry. Um, so that would be completely appropriate. If you think that it's better for you to set the goals based on the student, what you know about the students, that's 
fine too. With these goals, we are really just wanting students to have attainable goals um, that they are setting so that they can be successful. Um, and then what happens when they don't meet the goal? So this is why, uh, that was the other question. This is why I was interested in focusing on just some reflections on how um, did they improve uh, and what do they feel confident with and what do they feel like they need to know more about with the specific skill instead of explicit goal setting. It's kind of hard to have an explicit goal, especially for complex computation, when in the literature we haven't even agreed on what makes a fluent skill. So that's why I wanted to kind of make the goals more like improve um, as opposed to hit this stride. With the multiplication facts and addition and subtraction facts, we can get to a hit that stride, but even in that context, I don't, you know, not, we know that with the classified intervention, not every student is going to respond um, in the way that we hope. So not every student's going to meet that larger goal. So those goals that I'll tell you about later for your data are really for you. So with the student specific goals, it's just involving them in their learning. I hope that's clear. Hey, Robin, this is Lauren Lutz. Um, I was just working with a team and we did have a question in their particular situation um, because they're on a six day cycle and one of those days is specifically utilized for SEL programming, um, you know, they foresee and, and they won't be able to start next week uh, due to testing. Yeah. Um, so we discussed that it was better to start the class wide intervention and and get going with feet on the ground rather than getting to that eight week mark. Would that be? Because yeah, they were probably... they were concerned that they weren't going to get done by the time the next um session with you would take place. And I, I said it was better just to get going and um, do what you can do. Would exactly. You... Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah, there's absolute flexibility here. I just built the eight weeks because we have eight weeks. Um, and you even week, I think week seven and eight is combined because of the Thanksgiving holiday. So it, it's okay. That's why part of your share out will be what activities did you get to? What content areas did you cover? Um, how many weeks were you able to do? And I, I don't, I wouldn't worry about getting through that whole structure because that whole structure might not match what the needs are that you have in that in your school or as already was mentioned, the timing that's available. Okay. If there aren't any other questions, we'll move to the, the next um, segment that I'd like you to work through. And again, you'll have another 30 minute opportunity to go back and work with your um, with your teams. So this is to look at the content of the weekly packets. So um, if you already know that you are making modifications to the content, so that's gonna, then I want you to also think about, well, what do we need to create that hasn't been created? I can also assist with that. Um, <clears throat> do you wanna modify this, the checklist examples? The checklist examples, by the way, are in, weeks four and five. Um, they are really basic examples though. So you ha may have other checklist um, points that you would like to create. Um, do you wanna modify the decomposition maps that I built or the worksheets that I made? Um, and do you wanna add review activities? So do you feel like there needs to be more or different review activities? So for example, in week six, there's several review activities um, but you could add them to weeks four and five as well. You could modify them. So this is really getting into that weekly content. So we're going to send you back into those breakout groups. Um, and that is going to be another 30 minutes. And then we'll use our remaining time to talk more about the data. Um, that was, we just kind of had that the preview on. Okay, so um, this is hopefully you had a chance to review the weekly content. I will definitely, I'm hearing from um, the chat in, in between and, and from the facilitators that um, some, a different skill progression for some easier skill content might be helpful. So I will um, work on getting that to you next week so that you have some of those activities 
you can build your own sequence, but I'll, I'll do again a model one so that you have some things available to modify, adapt, adjust, or um, to use if as they are, they are perfectly fine. Another thing that came up in the chat was um, the models that I chose for complex computation. I just chose two models. The idea, of course, being that you want to have more than one model that you're using. So if you look at those complex computation schedule, um, you can see that there's a variety, uh, well, two built into that schedule per week, but you can use more. And I just didn't know which ones your uh, system prefers. So please feel free to add in those activities that are built around those models. Um, I think the other thing to keep in mind if you're adapting and modifying materials is to make sure you do have some worksheets that have that um, worked and not worked problems in them or partially worked problems if you're going to modify um, the models that are used. Um, you can also with like, for example, the decomposition mats that I built, those could be used laminated and you can use dry erase for um, for the player uh, instead of always using a worksheet. So that's just a, another um, quick tip that I can provide. Um, the other thing that came up was a typo. I am sorry. So I will clarify that for you when we talk about the data in terms of the one minute versus three minutes for progress monitoring. So um, I'll cover that in a minute when I talk about data. Are there any other questions that I have not covered that came up that you feel like need to be addressed before we do our our last um, little bit on the data itself. Hello, I have a, a one question. Um, how do we distinguish which materials pertain to certain grades? So like is the first set fourth grade, the second set fifth grade and the third set sixth grade? Nope, I kind of just built this whole thing trying to figure out what I thought all those grades could use um, and then how your how you need your skill progression to look will depend on your team. So that's where I was saying if you need um, if you need to have um, multi digit addition uh, without regrouping, then you can add that into your sequence. If you need to have, um, it sounds like many people need to have basic addition and subtraction. I'll build that into your sequence because I'm going to give you a, a like a simple uh, or earlier prerequisite sequence as well, so that you can share those activities. I just want to make sure that you have several weeks of activities that build on the skills that your students need. If you're in fifth and sixth grade, for sure, I would keep the multiplication as is and the fact families. If you're fifth grade, in fifth grade, if you're student, you feel like your students aren't ready for that yet, um, again, that's where I'll, I'll try to build that modified, um, that modified sequence that you can adapt from. And if there, if you, again, if you do thousands, um, when it comes to complex computation, I didn't build anything up to that point. So you can build those too. So the progress monitoring probes are all coming from MathFacts Cafe, so you can build them. And I tried to give samples of different ways that I thought about the materials. Um, but you can also use, you know, if you already have maps that you use for different models, then you can use those. So hopefully it gives you enough of a starting point that you feel like you can make the adaptations that you need to make. And then um, you're reading a lot of good questions. Um, and then the sequence can change because maybe your team needs like a planning week before you start and that's fine too so you don't have to have um eight weeks of activities built in before we meet the next time is that helpful yes thank you i had a tall task of trying to figure out where all of your schools were but that's why i wanted to give enough content enough materials that um that you could make those modifications yourself. Okay, so uh, there's a couple questions on the data. So I think I'll just, if it's okay with everyone, just go right into the data. Um, there's lots of different ways to, to do progress monitoring. Um, we This is sort of a modified way to do progress monitoring because you have multiple skills that you're addressing. Um, so, we are, this is, would be considered a subskill mastery approach where we're um, taking skills each week and then looking at how students progress on those skills. And then again, trying to build in some of those review weeks. So that's why in your sample, you have a, an addition and subtraction review week unit. I, again, to get back to that idea of interleaving. 
Um, so that's how this is designed, meaning that each week you have a pretest and a post test that should be built into your week materials. But I may have made some errors in either not uploaded it properly, or maybe I forgot to put in the second um, pretest, uh, post test. Uh, so, you know, feel free to let me know if that's the case and there's things missing and I need I need to address that. Um, what happens if your pretest scores are really high, then you're going to move to the next topic. If your pretest scores are really low, you might want to go to the previous week's topic. So you can make those kinds of adjustments as well. It sounds like a lot of you know already now ahead of time that some of the skill sequence is too hard for your students from where they're coming in. So again, I will build um, another, uh, I can have that next week um, for you where you have some other activities and a different kind of sequence to look at to see if that's helpful. All of these materials are, are intended to be modified. The way I structured it, um, try to keep that intact because I'm trying to make sure we have fluency building activities plus generalization activities. So that would be the review or game type activities that I've built in. I've tried to put skills together again um, to build that generalization at different points in time. So that's what the structure that's important to, to keep. Um, and again, using multiple models for complex computation, you may use different models. That's fine. Um, you just want to build that in. Um, you can make those modifications on MathFact Cafe. And again, on uh, mind.org, they also have some pre-made worksheets. Those worksheets tend to be um, they have fact family worksheets and they tend to, um, their other worksheets tend to be the traditional algorithm, just so you're aware. Um, and someone was asking previously um, about what are, what's the target. Um, for basic facts, it is 40 to 50 digits correct per minute is the target. There is a range there because there's different empirical data with, that has had a recommendation within that range of 40 to 50. So that's where ideally you'd like the median class performance to target. Remember, you're targeting the average class performance here. And then all other skills, the goal is to improve the scores because we don't have empirical data to say this is how fluent um, one needs to be. And of course, we know how accurate we're aiming for people to be. So um, with that, the, the simple skills are going to be one minute on the pretest post test the complex skills are going to be three minutes on the pretest post test i will make i will remake wherever that error was for you and upload it so that that's addressed um for the basic facts the one minute progress monitoring probe you want to um, score digits correct so you can teach the students how to just score those digits correct the answer key will be in digits correct for the complex computation, total digits in the answer is what the students can record and percentage of problems answered correctly. And all of these recommendations come from academic skills problems, which is Ed Shapiro's book and he was at Lehigh University. So these are just a couple of examples of um, what is an error and is not an error. Um, so you can review that uh, later, but Obviously, we, we don't count reversed or rotated digits as errors unless they're in the in a proper position in the answer. Individual correct digits are counted as correct. Things that are errors are counted as errors. And then if they're in the wrong place, then they would also, uh, when it comes to place value, then it would also be incorrect. But um, again, it's the digits, uh, the digits correct per minute is only done for um, the basic facts, and then I would just like students to look at total digits in the answer. So they're just counting up the total digits in the answer for all the problems they attempted, and then how many problems that were correct. You are going to um, report out next time on a table that looks like this, has median digits correct. Of course, not every week will you have that data. You'll only have that for the basic skills. And then you'll have median total digits and median percentage of problems completed correctly. Those latter two metrics are just for the complex computation. So again, you won't have them for every week either. Um, so this is a table that you can use. And you can see on the side, we have week one pretest, week one post test. So you're giving the pre and the post test median data. Um, the, whoops. The progress monitoring 
uh, directions should include information on how to teach the students how to score their own papers and record their own information. So that should already be built into the materials that you have, just so you know. And then um, when we talk about reporting out, there's a reporting out template that's in your materials. Uh, we just made one modification to it to add the adaptation slides so you can report out on adaptations. So you're going to describe the activities that you um, conducted during this uh, interval. Um, you're going to report the data in the table that I just illustrated to you. You're going to talk about what went well and what the barriers were that came up. And then talk about any solutions that you applied to address barriers. And once again, were any adaptations that you made, we'd like you to report on as well. So I am going to um, stop there. Again, I will build the, um, this other skill sequence for you. I, I hope to have it up next week for you. And I'm going to stop um, sharing and turn things over to Jared. Thank you so much for your time today.